Philip Blonde is the director and founder of renowned think tank ResPublica, and his ideas have been instrumental to David Cameron's big society. He is the man behind the British Conservative Party today. As well, Philip is an academic, journalist, and the author of Red Tory. Prior to entering politics and public policy, Philip was a senior lecturer in theology and philosophy, teaching at the universities of Exeter and Cumbria. He has written extensively in the British press, including for The Guardian, The Observer, The Financial Times, The Sunday Times, Prospect, and The New Statesman. And he appears frequently on the BBC and Sky, as well as foreign media outlets. His influence is reaching beyond the UK to shape the global right around the world, from Europe to the United States. So on the topic of the civic state, let me now introduce to you Philip Blond. Well, goodness me, um, a great pleasure to be here and thank you so much to ADC Forum for inviting me. Um, before I begin, what I'd like to suggest is, is perhaps why this matters. And I think, you know, let me paint some very broad strokes. The West is in trouble period, um, from, the, uh, from the US to Europe, uh, we've been crippled by different approaches by the left and the right that have resulted in the same phenomenon. Across the piece, massive concentrations of wealth at the top of society, massive increase in, in, in indebtedness across the rest of society and indeed across the states i.e. the national state. I realise Australia is in a different position. And it seems as though on the left and the right, the traditional ideologies that we've been pursuing for most of the 20th century, and especially since the Second World War, no longer work and are no longer delivering. The, the left has reached a clear economic and, in my view, moral bankruptcy. Um, across Europe, with the collapse of uh, the neoliberal, clearly right-wing economic settlement, you would have thought the left would sweep back into power, but it isn't. And the reason it isn't is in part the standard vehicle for left-wing thinking, the state. The state will rescue us from poverty. The state is a proxy for all public good, has failed. Even though we've massively augmented in many Western societies, the state, even though we've hugely increased its tax base, we pumped billions and billions in, the poor are still with us. In fact, it's proved very, very difficult in the major big complex democracies to use the state to relieve poverty. And much of the rhetoric around what the state has done in Britain, for instance, around child poverty, isn't really relieving poverty at all. All they ever did for families with the wildly expensive schemes that were adopted, is actually give poor families maybe five, maybe ten pounds, fifteen, twenty dollars more a week to push them just above the 60% of median earnings that counts as the poverty line. Those families don't feel they've been rescued from poverty, but the state can say, look, we've rescued millions from poverty. And one of the interesting indices that you see again in the US, in the UK, and increasingly across Europe, is that actually inequalities are rising and rising dramatically. So the left has failed. And the left doesn't have a vehicle to deliver on its primary claim. We will deliver social justice. By the same token, and this is why, in my view, we're in a profoundly new ideological and political space, the right has failed. Why has the right failed? The fundamental claim of the right is it would deliver mass prosperity for all. That a tide would lift all boats. Okay, some boats would be lifted more than others, but nonetheless, everybody would be better off. Well, that demonstrably and clearly hasn't happened. For certain income indices, for unskilled and now increasingly skilled manual, <coughs> manual workers, 
their income is lower now than it was in the 1970s. Also, the amount of capital that people at the bottom half of society can deploy has been dramatically reduced. In the United Kingdom, in 1976, the bottom 50% of the population, excluding property, had 12% of the liquid wealth. They had 12% of capital. Now, you and I know that actually you can't do very much without money, because money allows you to finance education, to start a business, to make a difference. But from 1976 to 2006, the bottom half of British society was decapitalised. Its share of the wealth, of the liquid wealth, savings, shares, cash in the bank, fell from 12% to 1%. And you see this phenomena across the society. Indeed, the growth that we've had, the growth that was meant to lift all boats, has actually been predominantly captured by the top, not 10%, but the top 1% of society. The concentration of assets at the top of society is phenomenal with regular ratios from comparing the bottom decile to the top decile uh, of over 100 to 1 in terms of assets. If you look at income, because of the use of things like tax credits and so on, that ratio is 10 to 1 at, at, at its highest. Often it's much lower. But in the UK and the US, it's 100 to 1 and rising. And if the rich capture assets... They make everyone else a serf. And we're actually living in an economy, and remember Hayek's road to serfdom, where increasingly we're producing what I call a rentier state, where the neoliberal model produces mass ownership, not by the mass, but by the few. They own so, so much, and everybody else is increasingly converted into a waged worker who doesn't own, but actually rents. Now, one way to explain that is share of businesses. So the percentage of the British population that actually owns business assets is only 12%. Okay, you think, okay, 12%, that's not so bad. But the median value of those assets is just £20,000. That tells you that there's a huge will and wish to enter the market and own businesses, but people actually own very, very little. And the reason they've owned very little is the right hasn't produced a free market, hasn't produced an open market, it's produced a cartel market, a closed market, an oligopoly. And that oligopoly effectively shuts out the path, the path to prosperity for everybody else. In addition to which, many of these transnationals don't pay any tax. They effectively and progressively avoid all taxation whatsoever. Just last week, uh, just yesterday, I was reading in one of the Australian newspapers about Google paying less than 1% of its global tax revenues. And what transnationals are able to do is they're able to domesticate losses and export profits to convert their business into a licensing or franchise agreement and charge franchise fees at such a level, profits effectively vanish. All well and good, you're in favour of tax competition, all well and good. But how can a small and medium-sized business compete with a transnational that already has a 20, 30 or 40% advantage? It can't. It's a rentier economy. So that's the analysis. That actually both left can't save you from poverty and the right can't deliver you prosperity. Something's broken on both sides of the political divide. And what I'm going to try and suggest to you now in uh, the slides and presentation is what we might do about that. If we accept that's a problem, and I think reason means we must, we need to, in some sense, create a new politics, create a new centre ground. And that is what, um, hopefully, uh, we at Res Publica and I myself are trying to do. I think I need water at this point. OK. So let's begin. The civic state is essentially an account of what I think is part, if not whole, wholly, the answer to our problems. OK, history of the left and the right. I've basically gone through that already. But I think the point to make is the path that the left took in the 1930s is it decided that 
you could never challenge monopoly ownership of capital. The left said, we can't challenge the lock that people have on wealth and capital. What we must do as a state is tax their transactions, is tax their business activities, and use the wealth that we've extracted via the bureaucratic state through welfare redistribution. And we'll just give people who don't own, who don't have access to the wealth, we'll give them welfare supplements. So in effect, the settlement of the left was already a neo-feudal settlement. It was already something that said, you know, not everyone can own, not everyone can share, but what we'll do is we'll actually create a generation of serfs who will never own, but we'll give them subsidy. Now, what I think is interesting is the bankruptcy of that model. And what I want to suggest is we've got to rethink the state away from a bureaucratic agent of redistribution to the state as the primary agent of distribution itself. The role of the state has to move from bureaucratic maintenance of poverty, which I think is what it does. The state doesn't get, get rid of poverty, it keeps people poor, often by marginal tax rates and often by the interaction between benefits and wages and the marginal tax rates that people feel or experience when they try to move from benefits into work. But more importantly, the state doesn't give people a start in life. It doesn't give them the asset effect. So the core problems, really, are that the state becomes a bureaucracy that actually takes power away from people and doesn't give power back. Now, one of the things that happens with welfareism, and I'm opposed to welfareism because I think it's essentially corrosive, one of the things that happened in Britain in 1945 with the welfare state is the left nationalised society. What do I mean by that? Prior to the welfare state, there were lots of bottom-up, often working-class organisations based not just on self-help, but on community organisation. So insurance societies, health societies, friendly societies. People lived, worked and grouped together to improve the lives of themselves, their families and their neighbourhoods. The cooperative movement in Britain, for example. The state, the left-wing state, rendered all of that superfluous. It said, no, you don't need to work with your neighbours, you don't need to work with your colleagues, you don't need to work with your workmates. The state will offer you one-way rights entitlements. So the state in, the, in Britain, oddly, through collectivism, individuated people. It created individuals who had one-way relationships with it rather than with anybody else. And that form of welfareism, that form of mass collectivism that essentially created this new form of individual welfare recipient was hugely damaging to working class societies. It stopped the bottom-up culture of civic self-help. Now, as soon as that happened, what you actually created was a whole generation of people for the first time who were individuals. Now, the interesting thing is, it's the left that first has a philosophy of individualism. Individualism is a left-wing philosophy, it's not a right-wing philosophy. And the role of the state in Britain was to make people individuals in the first place through entitlements that just go one way, merely by virtue of um, being under its auspices. Now, that form of individualism then created the new left in the 1960s. And the new left said, well, not only are we individuals in terms of what the state owes us, but we want to be sexual or sexually autonomous as well. We want to have no ties to anybody. We want to repudiate kith and kin. We want to repudiate family. And we want to pursue our ends regardless. And the left in the 1960s started to unpick and, and remove all the social fabric of our society around family, associations and relations. And if you don't think this is true, read Rousseau. Rousseau who said, man is born free but is everywhere in chains. Because the origin of left-wing thought is a hatred of society. Because for Rousseau, Rousseau thought we were born sui generis, emerged from the mist without any social connections, on our primary ontological or our primary reality is that of being sort of an individual born by his or her own actions. And society is then an imposition on that individual. 
Now, what's interesting is that's complete gobbledygook. That's complete philosophical, historical and anthropological nonsense. The truth of human beings is we're born in relationship, we're always born into culture, and we're born into society. But what happened in the 1960s is a radical form of left-wing individualism destroyed the social fabric of society. So what you have are two moves, extreme collectivism and extreme individualism, in the left that actually destroyed working-class life, working-class settlement and working-class culture. Now that individualism then in the 1970s moved over into economics and the right adopted an, individual, uh, an individualist economic policy. And actually what you have is a covert alliance between the left and the right that's basically following, following Rousseau. Well, the left pursues libertarian culture. You know, any form of family is fascism, any form of human connection is oppression, together with a libertarian economics. So we don't really have a left and right at all. What we have is the same philosophy governing us across left and right. And it's opposed to all that that I like to think of the philosophy of free association. So it's against that ruling paradigm that I want to try and create um, a new type of civic and social architecture. So that's the big society, or at least that's the hopes for the big society. And for me, the defence of family, human relationships, community and society is a conservative project. Why conservative? Because conservatism, properly understood, is not liberalism. Liberalism might be the outcome of, conserva of a conservative ground, but liberalism by itself only values individual acts of will. It isn't the basis for articulation of the common good. And conservatism wishes to conserve. It wishes to preserve what's good in society, augment it and create the conditions for its flourishing. And so for me, the future of conservatism is this new settlement, is this new politics of free association that operates against extreme individualism and extreme collectivism. Because extreme individualism and extreme collectivism are the same thing. The extremes of one produce the response of the other. And if you don't think so, go to Eastern Europe. Go to the societies that, have extreme, that had extreme collectivism. And all you see are the worst forms of capitalism, the worst forms of self-interest. Everything's corrupt, everybody's pursuing their own goals, a great social cost. So what are the new politics? The new politics are to re-articulate the common good, to re-articulate what this awful oscillation between collectivism and individualism has destroyed. And I think we pursue this common good through a new architecture of the free associations of citizens. So people in towns, cities, villages and groups come together to say what they need and they create their own approach to solving crime, to creating a state that works for them, to creating ownership, to creating assets, to moving away from merely wage labour to being asset owners, traders and people with a stake in the world. So if we're going to challenge this, then we have to challenge this post-war settlement. And I believe this is the new 21st century paradigm that, uh, that will increasingly become the politics and the architecture of the West if we want to escape from where we currently are. So let's sum up the core problems that uh, we hope to tackle. The concentration of assets. Nobody can deny this. This is factual to the most disturbing degree. Now, if you think, um, well, this doesn't matter in Australia, because in Australia we're fine, actually the uh, ratio between the bottom 20% um, and the top 20% in your society is already 50 to 1. Those at the top already ha have ratios of wealth of 50 to 1. If you go to the top 10% and the bottom 10%, it's 268 to 1 in terms of total wealth. So Australia is already on the path to the sort of society that has broken down so remarkably in the United States and the United Kingdom. There's the social problem. Now what's interesting is that, remember I talked about how the welfare state fragmented our society? 
Work in Britain has shown that social capital, if you like, our connections, our friendships, our relationships, the people who we're connected to, has hemorrhaged. So much so that the weakest societies in the UK in the 1970s, the ones that had the lowest rate of social uh, relationship, are now stronger than our strongest societies today. People are lonely, fragmented, isolated, and unable to link with others. And the lower down the, the income scale you go, the greater the level of loneliness, the greater the separation. And that's why in the UK we have such a poor rate of social mobility. Indeed, the rate of people in the lowest um, uh, income groups to rise to the income groups below it is lower now than it was in the 1970s. We're recreating caste and we're recreating class as determinants. And that's true in the US and in Britain. So how are we going to make a difference? Because there's a real civic problem. Not enough people are getting involved. How do we make people associate? Uh, the people who do volunteer, who do try to recreate um, human relationships, they're actually more and more of them... Uh, sorry, more and more of them... <laughs> Less and less of the hours are being done by everybody and more and more of the volunteer hours and the type of people who make a difference are done by a smaller and smaller group. And part of this is because the state keeps accruing power and keeps acting for people, so keeping them passive. Now, some, more, some further figures that I've already mentioned. And you can see from these, in, these indices that actually Australians are not far behind where the UK was. If you actually look at income inequality, for instance, in the US, you can see that the rise of those at the top has far outstripped the rise of those at the bottom. And if you actually include debt in that, you can see that the, those at the bottom have taken on massive, massive amounts of debt. And actually, the, what's happened in the path from the 1970s to now is that in households, all members of the households now work, Household working hours have vastly increased because more people work, but they get less of a share of the wealth for the work they do than they ever did. The highest share of wage labour from the wealth was in 1968. In Australia, the uh, share of wage labour wealth has fallen from just over 63% in the 1970s to approaching just 50% now. So wage labour is getting less and people have to work more. As I said, social capital in Britain is declining. Australians similarly are less connected than they were, but precisely where well, you would be because you're subject to similar forces, albeit perhaps of a lesser intensity. But what's interesting is that um, in the... Um, we have a situation where fear of crime is rising and still rising, but real crime is falling. And we often have the situation where old people, if you will, are in their homes terrified when young people are on the streets. But actually, real crime is diminishing, but people's fear is rising. How do you create a condition whereby people can talk across generations so they can foster social trust, so people's lives are dramatically improved? As I said, if the task is to recreate intermediate associations, to recreate institutions that can make a difference, how on earth can you do it? All of the free actions of citizens working together is being radically diminished. You can see in Australia, organisational membership has fallen from 33% in the 70s to just 18% now. So if we're going to provide a difference, if, if there's going to be something other than individuals facing the state alone, because ind if individuals face the state alone, they lose, we've got to come together and recreate a civic middle. So towns, cities, communities have to, in some sense gain back control over their streets, over their economy, and start to create assets, ownership, and a sense of empowerment that hitherto for has been stripped away from them. It's clear that the state isn't the answer, because the state both um, intervenes too much and is experienced as hostile, 
and becomes a paternalist um, phenomena that strips, strips the ability of people to act in their own name. Now, what's interesting is 67% of people agree that local people getting involved in services uh, will improve them. And what I think we're beginning to see, actually, is most people, interestingly, feel that they would like to make a contribution, they would like to make a difference. This isn't just kind of fake um, hopes by a right wing that wants to cut the state. People realise if they're going to take control of their health, they have to kind of make a contribution. If they're going to take control of crime, they have to make a contribution. And you can actually see across uh, health, uh, policing and schools, and even local transport, something approaching over half percent in, in the case of policing, 60% uh, in the case of health, actually want to make a difference. There's a real sense uh, in our society that people would make the contribution if it proved efficacious. So what's the diagnosis? Well, hopefully that's fairly clear now. Both welfareism and our market model have encouraged uh, not only asset concentration, but massive bureaucracy. Now, if you think about, if you agree that there's something problematic in the way our markets work, that all of our mass markets are just two, three, or four competitors who are locking us out, then what the left has done is said, OK, well, if we've got these monopolies, let's regulate. But the trouble is, regulation is pro-monopoly and pro-incumbency. Because regulation is another barrier to market entry. And uh, I was working with one of our, um, our members in East London, and it's in the heart of a Bangladeshi community. And they didn't have any Bangladeshi SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, competing for their contracts. And they said, why? We've got a massive equality and diversity um, policy. And they went out and they spoke to Bangladeshians and they said, well, your equality and diversity policy is so difficult, so big and so complex, we can't possibly fill it in so we don't bother. And I think that exemplifies the problem of regulation. Regulatory barriers, they become so complex and so difficult that only big players can access them. So you have a double conspiracy against prosperity and a double conspiracy against new market entrants. So both state and market in this way squeeze out the civic middle. Not only do they stop free associations forming, but they stop a political economy for those free associations taking place because everything needs an economic path to a future. And if we don't give an economic path to a future so that citizens can actually become asset owners and business owners, they're not going to. 78% of all British businesses are just sole traders. They can't get a look in. OK. How do we create a big society? What is a big society? A big society is where you can make a difference to your area because the state is no longer an enormous bureaucracy, but the state, en state enables you to make your park safe, the state enables you to tackle crime, the state enables you to have an effective health service, the state enables you to have good schools. But if we want to have good schools, good health services, if we want to create a state that works for us, in some sense we have to own it. In some sense we have to create a civil state. How do we create a civil state? How do we get the better personal and social outcomes? Let me give you an example. You create a state that is owned by its citizens. You create a type of society where people have, have a shot as well. So what does this asset-owning democracy mean? Well, we argued at ResPublica that we should take all of our public services and mutualise them that all of our public services should become mutual companies, should become companies that are owned by the people themselves and the citizens they serve. And you might say, oh, that's nonsense, Philip, that won't deliver anything. But actually, if you look at employee-owned companies, they've outcompeted the FTSE 100 over the last 10 years by 10% every year. Because employee-owned companies enable you to strip out bureaucracy, strip out the costs of suspicion, st strip out audit. And we know that uh, every layer of management that you have 
costs you 20% of your budget as the budget drives through to the front line. So if you can create flatter, more mutual associations, you can deliver something remarkable. One good example of this is Sandwell, which is in the West Midlands in my country. And they took out residential care for adults and children from the council and they formed a cooperative charity. Now, that cooperative charity then three years back did an audit. In-house care that remained in the council was uh, being charged at £658 per person per week. In the cooperative charity, it had fallen to £328 per person per week. So automatically you think, oh, goodness me, the employees must have been, and this is a technical term, screwed, and they must have had a terrible time. But actually what happened is quite the reverse. Sick days per employee fell from 22 days per year in the council to 0.3 days per year. The amount of bureaucracy was slashed, with frontline expenditure rising from 63% to 86%, and staff and patient satisfaction went through the roof. This is the new model to deliver a different settlement. Now, what I think is interesting in the UK is the localism bill that's going through Parliament now. And what I believed, because I grew up in the north of England that was terribly damaged by uh, the recession, it's never recovered, is actually, though, in Britain we have some of the most expensive po poverty in the world. We spend billions and billions on housing, benefit, on crime, on all forms of social expenditure, and the population is permanently passive and can't do anything to change its outcome. But everywhere I go, even in some of the most benighted areas, there's people who want to make a difference. There's people whose mothers, brothers, daughters or husbands have died because of drug abuse or are subject to crime. Why can't we empower those citizens with state budgets rather than have a, an ineffective bureaucracy wasting money and not making the difference it can make? So I argued that citizens should have the right to take over state budgets that if citizens come together in an association, particularly in poor areas, they can recapitalise by taking over state budgets and running state budgets for themselves or their estate. So as poverty concentrates, especially in urban areas, you can actually have the citizens of an estate controlling the money that's spent on that estate. And that can deliver all manner of benefits and controls you can actually start to recapitalise those communities because they own the capital in those communities and they can make a difference. One of the other things I argued for is the community right to buy so that citizens can take over public assets. So, for instance, often in urban areas, you have shopping precincts that are dreadful because they're full of crime and uh, drug addiction, etc., and they're not utilised. But since property values are in essence related to social values, if the community can buy the, that strip of shops, then actually, the, and it's often the mothers on these estates, they can control the behaviour around those estates. And if then they can put in their own community ventures, for instance, a people's supermarket, because actually often in the UK, uh, those who are poorest live furthest away from uh, supermarkets and places of um, food retail, then if they can actually change behaviour, start their own food rate retail business, not only do they start to become business owners and asset holders, but the asset value of that whole strip of shops suddenly rises dramatically. So suddenly from people who own nothing, they own a stake in a business and they own an a, a stake in an asset that's rising. And then you can create all manner of joint venture models. So this is why the big society isn't just about volunteering or philanthropy, important as those are. It's about economic development, enabling people to, as Mohammed Yunus said, move up their supply chain, both public and private, making their own jobs. And that's why I think the opportunities offered <clears throat> by mutualisation on the one hand and right to buy and right to take over and right to challenge on the other offer a genuinely different model of the state. Now, happily, everything that I argued for, and others have argued for, is now in the localism bill going before Parliament. It's happened. It's going to become part of our British policy mix. But what I want to suggest to you is, and the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom are now the biggest agent of workers' cooperatives in the country, far more effective than the Labour Party were. 
So you can see that what's happened is the state in Britain has moved from a redistributive welfareist model to primary acts of distribution to recapitalising poorest communities. And I think that's transformative. Now, what I think um, is interesting is that actually this resonates strongly with where people are feeling. Most people feel that they're actually being burnt by a rabid individualism that actually always empowers people other than themselves. So this isn't sort of some twee wish that don't, doesn't find a resonance, uh, certainly in the British population. Actually, I think it will find an increasing resonance and receptivity across the board because people intuitively know the system we've been following kind of is broken and doesn't work. There's all sorts of exciting new policies to bring about the sort of change that I'm talking about. Um, one of the things about people who are unemployed is they're time rich and asset poor. But if you can create time banking schemes, not where people exchange time, you know, I'm an accountant, I give two hours, somebody does my garden. That doesn't work because our communities are so mobile. But if you can create time banking schemes whereby people do the social good for their community and the council can offer money off leisure facilities for the social good, they work incredibly well. So what you can do is you can start to rebuild social capital in our most fragmented communities. And if you think loneliness doesn't matter, if you think all oh, this is all nonsense, all the evidence is against you. Loneliness is a causal correlate of mental illness, drug addiction, crime, um, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, mental illness, obesity. If you start to tackle these so-called soft factors, you start to solve hard factors and you save real money. There's other very interesting things. Social impact bonds. Um, this is the first time in the world that I know of where you actually have the capital markets linked with social outcomes. Prisoner reoffending. Now, what's interesting is the state is a very poor parent, as you no doubt will concede. But the state is a worse rehabilitator of criminals. Generally speaking, out of every cohort released in Britain, 66% of those who are released in two years not only will reoffend but will be reconvicted. Nearly two thirds of prisoners are reconvicted. And think of the human misery that involves, not just for the prisoners themselves and their families, but for their victims. I believe burglary is an offence against the person. And this is what these people do. So you can stop these damaging people, you do a great good. What's interesting is if you let charities, often faith-based charities, if you let people care for people rather than the state, you can have dramatic effects. So if the normal rate of reconviction is something like 60 to 66%, depending whether it's men or women, what do you think social charities, often, often faith-based, can get reoffending down to? Not 50%, not 40%, not 30%, not 20%, but in certain cases, 15%. People can be saved from that life. Now, that produces millions and millions and millions of pounds of savings. But how do you fund the project that stops people from going back into crime and prison? Well, what you do is, a, as a government, you create a bond. You say to these um, intermediate groups, these charities and social enterprise organisations, you say, if you deliver this percentage fall in the reconviction rate, we'll pay you X. And that contract then is taken to the private sector, and the private sector funds it through a bond. So then you have a financially sustainable way to genuinely tackle something as difficult as prisoner reoffending. That's the sort of transformative element that's operative in the big society. Now, Blended finance, well, what does that mean? That sounds nuts. But actually, in the US, there's a form called the L3C company. And, part, and if we believe, and as I think we should, that the path out of poverty isn't through welfare, but is through business, through ownership and entrepreneurship, which I believe in, what L3C companies do is they allow you to blend charitable cash and private income. And what charitable cash does is it buys out the risk curve and so makes investment in these sort of models actually viable. 
So if you start to price in um, models that the standard private sector wouldn't price in, you open up markets, opportunity, and assets to those who otherwise wouldn't have a shot. So to conclude... Lots of evidence in the UK shows that actually you can make a transformative difference to the state and the market by creating a new participative model. So something like public procurement, depends which market you're in, but it can be 40, 50, 60% of certain markets. And if you can have something like citizens-led commissioning, so the UK government has said actually 25% of certain public procurement has to go to small businesses. Under New Labour, all business went to just three companies, Serco, G4S and Capita. All very good companies, excellent in some cases, but not empowering ordinary people and not empowering people often at the bottom of society to get out of their circumstance. But what the new British government's doing is trying to encourage the formation of social enterprises, people who can solve their own problems through actually competing for public sector budgets. And by having new low bureaucracy minimal participation models, the aim is to increase that to 25% of all public procurement, to open up the market for small and medium-sized enterprises so we stop the capture of the market by oligopolies and vested interests. So what am I suggesting to you? I'm suggesting radical new conservatism is about what radical old conservatism was about. In the 19th century in the UK, all of the progressive social policy was driven by the conservatives. The conservatives, often Christian, led the fight against slavery. The British state was the first major state to go against slavery, and it deployed the Royal Navy against slave ships. The uh, working hours bills, it was actually the Whigs in Britain who wanted working class women and children to work 16 hours a day. It was the Tories who were behind the 10-hour bills, the factory bills, the bills to prevent children and women being exploited. All of this led to Disraeli in the 19th century, where Disraeli's Reform Act was far more radical than anything Gladstone was coming up with. And why? Why? And what I want to suggest to you is conservatism isn't a about an individualist assertion of self-interest. That actually comes from the liberal tradition and from the left tradition. Radical conservatism is organic, one-nation Toryism that is committed to the good of all. And in being committed to the good of all, it has a critique of that extreme collectivism and that extreme individualism. And that critique is about recreating the civic middle where people can work together to change everything. And this means that actually conservatism is the new pro-social philosophy. Conservatism wants to create a civic state that's owned by people. Conservatism wants to create a market that works for all people. It wants to moralise the market. And if you create a market that genuinely includes everybody and isn't based on some Marxist analysis that the Conservative Party conforms to of essentially creating just low-wage workers... But if you actually create what the visionaries of the market, Frank Knight and Hayek, argued for, which is a capitalism working for all, then you create a market that delivers for all, and that's a moral market. And the key to this is rebuilding an associative society, rebuilding a society that works together to create the society that we all want to live in. And so to conclude, most of us know what we want. Most of us, we want streets and areas that are clean, safe and green. Most of us don't want poverty. Most of us want our fellow citizens to do well, and in so doing well, they won't threaten us. Most of us want economic security, not just for ourselves, but for our friends, our family, and crucially, our children. And yet, everything about our society is making ourselves more economically insecure, more reliant on debt, more individuated, less able to associate, less happy. We can create the new politics that speaks to what people want. I think it will take the centre ground, and I think it's the future of Western politics. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Philip. That was an extraordinary presentation. Um, I th perhaps we could turn the focus, I guess, more specifically uh, to Australia. And before we open up for questions, uh, conservatism in Australia probably refers more to conserving liberalism um, than it does the notion of conservatism that you've been discussing. What do you see as the dangers for Australia, both in the political landscape and for the nation as a whole? The danger for Australia is, I think, all of your rhetoric sounds very much like Britain in the 90s or America in the 90s and America in the 2000s. It's oddly out of step with the rest of where I think the world is. And there isn't a critique of the um, paradigms that essentially have bankrupted the United States nearly and bankrupted Europe. And you think, well, OK, Australia's in a different situation because... In the US and the UK, you had bubbles supporting bubbles. But in Australia, what you've got is a real resource. You've got minerals you can dig, you can sell, but supporting a bubble economy elsewhere. Now, at some point, that mineral resource will, um, will stop being the resource it is. And either it runs out, which is unlikely, or what's more likely is there's an economic slowdown elsewhere. So the key task for Australians is, first of all, to make the most of that economic resource. Now, if you look at Norway, Norway is almost the best template for how a nation should use its economic resource. And if you look at per capita parity between how the Norwegians approached their resources and how the Australians did over the last booms, essentially Norway profited um, three times as much as the Australians. And actually, because Norway's got a smaller population, if you were just for population... Norway's sovereign wealth fund is now at $2.8 trillion, whereas Australia owes just, well, it's over $600 billion in national debt. And that's because what the Norwegians did is they made sure the government was involved in joint ventures uh, with those um, extraction companies and made sure those extraction companies increased the whole skill wealth of the economy. But that hasn't happened in Australia. In Australia, it's just one-off, and it's not you're not approaching the asset in a way that will endow your country. So what I fear is that actually you're, you won't make the most of this boom, and you won't renew your economy. There are already skills shortages. There are already uh, situations where, I think, Michael, your father, was telling me uh, teachers were giving up their jobs to drive trucks in New South Wales. Well, that's not a good position for a country to be in. And if you don't tackle what's already emerging as a... Um, highly uh, unequal country, you will actually get into the similar position the US and the UK got into, which is you'll create a form of welfareism that will gradually become middle class. And actually, isn't that what the Howard government did? Created huge amounts of middle class welfare. The trouble is, if you create huge amounts of middle class welfare, you create huge levels of taxation. And actually, your tax system is very peculiar because you have phenomenally high taxes on earned income and extremely low taxes on unearned income. And if you wanted to create a society that rewarded speculation rather than hard work and savings, it would be your own present system of taxation. And actually, what happens in the way you subsidise uh, property, in the way you subsidise capital ownership, and the way you let interest rates be deducted, is you're giving a massive subsidy to those who already own. And that massive subsidy is enough for 20,000 20, new homes every year in your country. So I, what I fear about Australia is you're already on the, on the road to a model that's already broken. And nobody's talking about how you can avoid that fate. And I think that that's what worries me the most in terms of Australia. OK. We don't have a lot of time for questions, but let's take a few. One over there. Uh, thank you for an absolutely fascinating presentation. I think there are real questions as to how red Toryism relates to globalisation, which haven't really been addressed and which are vital. But I don't want to ask about that. I want to ask two questions. Um, the first relates to entropy and the second relates to mistakes. Now, on entropy, my point here is that um, there was a long period of time, many decades, when um, welfareism and, social and, and, and individuation um, undercut the fabric of the state that you, or the fabric of the societies that you're describing. How long do we have in building that back up? So that's the first question. How do we overcome the entropy of many decades? The second question relates to mistakes. Because when you talk about um, the state stepping back, individuals and uh, communities stepping in, the reality is that many of them will make mistakes. Things will go wrong. Things will screw up. 
Uh, and how prepared are we as a society and as a culture to accept experimentation, to accept the mistakes that go with that? Thank you. To take, answer your, first, your second question first, you're absolutely right that one of the critiques of everything uh, that we're trying to do is, oh my God, you're getting rid of standards. You're getting rid of universality. People step in, they'll do things different, they'll fail. But what's interesting is the state is already failing. So in Britain, we have standardised, universalised healthcare, and yet health outcomes vary wildly. In certain parts of Britain, we have life expectancy lower than the Sudan, and that's in Glasgow. Other parts of Britain, your life expectancy varies by your postcode. So standard approaches already don't work, and they don't work because they're standard. Standardisation and universalisation is the great driver up of costs. Why? Because human beings vary. The nature of our world is we vary by, by location, by culture, by illness, by geography, by how we live, how we eat, etc. And what we have to create are new forms of variation in service delivery if we're to tackle health. But standardised, centralised healthcare can't cope with human variation. So therefore, it will be very expensive and will fail to deliver. What we need to do is create a new kind of highly variable form of, not variable in terms of quality, but in terms of being open to variation. Create new forms of public service that can actually speak to human variation and meet the demand. To, to go to um, your, your, net, your first question, entropy and, and welfare. Well, what's happened in the UK is, in welfare is quite remarkable. Ian Duncan Smith, um, a conservative, a Catholic, and uh, Lord Freud, who, who's have together produced a welfare system that finally allows people on welfare to work. Because you know marginal tax rates. Marginal tax rates are you come off welfare and you work, but your loss of benefit is so high that you don't make anything from work. And depending on what you are, it can be in the 90 percentile. So you might start work and it might be part-time, but you'll lose all of your housing benefit. So you work, you go out to work, and you don't benefit at all. Now, not only do you not benefit, but your welfare system, when you tell them it's working, the welfare payments stop. And because those at the bottom of society are on their own, don't have families because they've been removed, they're absolutely vulnerable. And people are terrified of losing the form of security they have, not gaining from work, and actually entering real insecurity. So what I think is great in what the British government's doing is they've actually lowered the taper, tried to make work pay. They're still high, the marginal tax rates, but much, much lower, and tried to create a welfare system that actually enables people to work. What's missing from the current mix is two things. Is there's no way... It hasn't been integrated with self-startup, hasn't been integrated with the poor, actually, as it were, making their own jobs, and there's no approach to asset welfare. But I think it's a start. Philip, Matt Jones, uh, that, was, that was very interesting... Um, I'm just interested to know what your thoughts are on the future of corporate social responsibility, mm. particularly um, the notion of uh, corporate citizenship in relation to what you said. I view myself as pro-business. Uh, I hate regulation, uh, and I think much of uh, what's happened assumes business is evil. And because it assumes business is evil, it creates all this architecture that stops business being... The, in, the prosperity engendering activity that it is. But I think corporate social responsibility is over, and rightly so. Let me just draw a, a model. They remember that, that dreadful... Or you, won't, you might not have heard of it. There's this dreadful firm in Europe called um, Trial, Trial Figura, and they had um, this awful toxic waste that was in the port of Rotterdam, like the most toxic thing you can imagine. And they essentially sailed it over to Africa and dumped it in Africa. Now, corporate social responsibility, if that firm that said, OK, we'll sponsor a local football team in Africa, would be entirely... That would be a coherent corporate social responsibility model. So corporate social do responsibility doesn't work if the, your business model is already damaging and then you just sponsor a football team or do something nice for kind of people on a Wednesday. You can't do something nice for people on a Wednesday if every other day you're doing harm. So what we actually have to do is create social business, period, and what's interesting is social business period is very, very good business. Because actually, Western consumers are starting to select for outcome. And um, they're starting to select for trust. And if you, if you as a company 
try to create outcomes that people won't select for, over time you'll be damaged and you won't become a trading platform that can work. So I think the future of 20th century, 21st century capitalism is trust. Take, for example, eBay. So if you'd said, sort of before eBay was invented, you're going to be able to buy football tickets um, of somebody uh, 300 miles away who you've never met, you're going to send them money and they will send you football tickets, you'd be laughed at. You'd be a foolish idiot. What a, what a, how laughable. And yet that's what's happened. And why does it happen? Because people's reputations are now worth more than any individual one economic transaction. In that way, we're curiously medieval. We're recreating the paradigms of the Middle Ages, in part through 21st century technology, because reputation is now worth more than anything. And then being a reputable trader, getting star ratings, means people will always deal with you. And if you don't have to go through due diligence, if you don't have to go through audit, if you don't have to go through compliance, you create an economic model that is highly, highly efficient. If you think that the cost of most economic transactions, depending what they are, can be as high as 20, 30, 40% because they're based on suspicion. And then if you create those levels of costs for market entry, how can small and medium-sized businesses get a look in? So actually, if we want mass entrepreneurship, which I want, if we want mass ownership, which I want, if you want to create the... Um, the groups and the hubs that actually generate prosperity, you have to create new moral markets. And this isn't kitsch. This is actually something that will deliver real cost savings and actually, for the businesses that do it well, genuine and real increases in profits. Hopefully that's an answer.